Um, now we have to do with the whole point of this, this whole semester, this week, is a real pulley. Real pulley has mass. Has mass. Okay. So let's solve this again. But now, whoops, I like to draw the heavier one lower, even though that doesn't really have to be that way. M1, M2, like that. And let's give the pulley M3, ooh, R, and give it a radius R. And ask the simple question, how fast is it going to go now? How fast will it accelerate if we let it have a mass? Hmm. And we're going to define up as the positive direction again, down as negative. We're going to rotate that disk. And we want to start labeling it, and we want to label it with some tension. So we say, okay, T here, but now we're going to lose the ability to say the tension is constant. Oh, the tension is not constant through the loop, the, ro uh, the, ro the rope now, because uh, what happens is we have to now rotate something with a mass. So that takes a torque, and a torque requires a force. So the rope has to apply a force. So the rope applies a force to the disc. Has to happen. So the only way a massive disc can start turning. Here, the force it took to turn a massless disc is zero. Right? That's because it was massless. The hint I mentioned about the pledge problem was to the pledge problem we've already done. So if somebody's asking if we have another pledge problem, because I said I gave a hint, I meant to the one that's it's, it's not a useful hint, unless you have like a time machine or something. Okay, so now that, what that means is the tension here is different from the tension here. So a rope, if it's a continuous rope and it's tied between two things, right, I told you it has a tension, it applies a tension to either side, so it always applies its tension to two places. That's still happening here. This rope is applying its tension to M1, and now it's applying it to the disc, because the disc needs a force to move. This one is applying its tension to two places, to M2 and to the disc. Therefore, we have to call them tension left and tension right. The tensions will not be the same if it goes around a pulley with a mass, unless it's frictionless on the surface. Okay? Pulleys are horrible because we say lots of stuff about them. They either have mass or they don't have mass. Fine. But then we might say it's a frictionless pulley. Does that mean frictionless here at the bearing, or does that mean the frictionless where the rope goes around it? Uh, it matters, right? Usually it means the bearing. We won't do a frictionless pulley, don't worry. Right? But you can imagine if the surface of the pulley were frictionless, then it's just going to slide over. It can't apply a force to it. There's, there's no such thing as a frictionless pulley. It's, it's a stupid concept. Let me not throw out confusing things. Let's just stop. Okay. So how many unknowns do we have now? We don't know the left tension, we don't know the right tension, and we don't know the acceleration. So we have three unknowns. We better come up with three forces. Oh, I bet you we can. Let's see. Let's look at uh, this. We need three forces. So three unknowns. We need three equations. UNK. Unks. We need three equations. So let's look at mass one. The first two parts are just like before, except we don't just call it T. We call it TL. This has the left tension up minus M1G down equals, and this part's the same, uh, minus M1A. This acceleration we're looking for is just A, and we know it's down because we said M1 is heavier than M2. It's going to go this way. Okay. Let's see what this brilliant question is here. Can you explain again why the disk on the left diagram experiences no force? Because it has no mass. Right? M equals zero. So what force does it take to move something with no mass? Essentially no force. Um, this one has a mass. Uh, let's see, so there's that one. And you may be wondering, are the A's the same? We made the tensions different. Are the accelerations the same? The accelerations are the same. Okay. So even though the rope is applying a frictional force to the pulley, it's still inextensible. Right? It's still a rigid rope that can't be lengthened or whatever. So it's still true that if the rope moves some amount here, it has to move the same amount there. Therefore, the A is still the universal A. Okay. Let's look at the second one. Its equation, almost the same, except we use TR. Right? Same over there, except we use TR. So the right tension, TR up, minus M2G down, equals M2A, plus M2A. 
because it's going up. It's going to accelerate up. Do, do, do. That looks almost exactly the same as over here, except the tensions are different. So we need a third equation, and the third equation is the rotational part. So we've got to think about M3. Uh, M3. So we're going to apply Newton's second law, just like we were doing here, but we'll write it again since it's new. Some of the torques equals I alpha. Or T, uh, tau is the torque, I is the moment of inertia, alpha is the angular acceleration. Okay? So the torques, so in this case, a pulley is kind of easy because a pulley, it always pulls at right angles. Right? If a string leaves a circle, it has to do it tangential to the circle. You can't not do it tangential to the circle unless you bend the string and then it's not a string. Okay? So a string pulling a pulley will always just be tension times a radius. Right? So the force is this way, the R vector is that way, add them tail to tail, 90 degrees, sine of 90 is one, or it might be negative. It depends on which way it goes. Okay? So we could, let's get really advanced here, because you want to be able to do the problems kind of quickly. You don't want to have to write out every little thing. So let's do both torques in one fell swoop here. TL is making it turn in the positive direction. That's probably the positive torque. TR is making it turn in the negative direction. So that's the negative torque. So if you want the net torque and you're really with it here, you can say TL minus TR times the radius of the wheel. Right, that's the net torque. Okay. We could draw all every vector. If you want to do every vector, come to office hours. We'll do it vector at a time. And we can get the left torque, vectors, 90 degrees, theta's 270 or something crazy like that. Right torque, vectors, but if you're kind of realizing, oh, this is a simple case. Everything's 90 degrees. This pulls it that way, that pulls it that way. It might help your intuition to be able to just say, oh, difference in the tensions times R. Right. What is the moment of the disk? Hmm, let's see. I thought counterclockwise was positive. Uh, the way I wrote this is correct, so I probably said the wrong word. This is pulling it counterclockwise. That's why I made TL positive. I probably just said it backwards. I tend to do that. Don't listen to what I say and don't pay attention to what I write. So wouldn't TR be making it go in the... Yeah, I must have said it backwards, clearly. Why is TL pulling to the row? Oh, my goodness. Is this all correct? Let's see. <laughs> so I confused everybody on rotation. I must have said everything totally upside down. This is the left side because your finger, this finger makes an L. Okay? <laughs> if you do this and you want to know which one is left, it's the one that makes an L. I told George that when he was little, and he said, they both make an L. Idiot. Um, this is the left side. And uh, if we just imagine, which way is this going to turn when we pull down? So the tension pulls in the direction of the rope when it leaves the circle. So it's pulling down. I was just saying if it's pulling down, it's clearly going to make it go this way. A clock hand goes that way. right? So this is counterclockwise. TL counterclockwise. And we know that counterclockwise is positive. That's weird that we define it that way, but we do. Okay? So that's why this one is turning it positive, this one's turning it negative. I must have said it backwards and confused everybody, sorry. I probably said it backwards. Yeah. Uh, why isn't R squared in the last equation I wrote? Because that's a torque. We haven't got to the moment yet. R cross F. Okay, I should have put the R on this side. It's normal to put the R on the left side. So, but I put it on the wrong side, sorry. Now we're going to do the moment. What's the moment of a disk? One half M3, in this case, R squared. Just the formula for the moment of a disk, right? Nothing crazy. And then just to keep us trucking along, we're going to do another uh, baby step here, all in one equation. I'm going to make you do this like a, you know, like a really fast person would do it. We're supposed to write alpha there, but let's not write alpha because that's another unknown, isn't it? It's sort of like now we have a fourth unknown. We don't know alpha. But in these problems, you've got to remember alpha is always related to A because we're talking about edge motion, right? As these things move up and down, their acceleration, and we have a string that can't be stretched, must be the same as the tangential acceleration of the disk. Right, let's write that down because that applies to every problem. A, let's see, alpha is related to the AT, of the edge of the disk, which equals A. You definitely want to understand that concept for any pulley or rotational problem with acceleration in it, or even without acceleration in it. 
understand what I'm doing with this alpha, okay? I know this is accelerating at A. I know the string is accelerating at A. Therefore, I know the edge of the disk is accelerating at A, which we could call A tangential. I don't think we've really used that much, but that's the idea. How fast is this uh, edge accelerating? So therefore, I have a relationship between these two. And then you think, oh my god, there's an R in it. I can't remember. Just remember S equals theta R. S equals theta R. Take a derivative. V tangential. What's the derivative of theta? Omega R. Take a derivative. A tangential equals alpha R. So if you forget where the R goes, just remember S equals theta R. The R goes on the angular part. So that tells us that the alpha that we're using is actually the tangential acceleration of the edge divided by r. A t divided by r. But we know A t is really just A. Right? So the whole point of that was just to write this in terms of A instead of alpha. Alpha is just A over r. That was fun. Um, and then you say, oh, there's no r's in it. Oh my god, look at this. That r cancels one of those r's, but then that one remaining r cancels that r. So the size of the pulley doesn't matter. You can make you can be David Byrne and get a giant pulley. No, okay. <laughs> you just went to Sid 80s, and you got to know David Byrne's the guy with a giant suit, talking heads. No, okay. Uh, I'll tell Jennifer I tried. Let's see. So now we have our three equations and three unknowns, right? Uh, the left tension, the right tension, and the A acceleration. A, and what's left on this one? Oh, this is going to simplify down to not a whole lot left here. So T L minus T R, what's left? One half M three times A is all that's left. You could probably do the algebra for the rest yourself. Let's see. Uh, why does having a mass of pulley cause? Oh, it's a, hmm. Why does having a mass of the pulley cause the Atwood machine to have torque? It causes the Atwood machine to need torque. If you're going to turn that massive pulley, you have to have a torque. Has to, the torque has to be applied. The pulley can't just start spinning from nowhere. So the string has to apply the torque. How come the tension equals the torque? Oh, it doesn't. It's the tension times the r vector. Right? So that is really that tension really was r times f sine theta. I just skipped all that. Right? R is the magnitude of that. F is the torque. Is the net torque. And sine theta is all 90. That was where I said let's do this in one step. So and get you used to kind of moving faster. OK, so in the end, this is equal to that. And uh, now we just substitute. And then this gets down to wisdom. right? How do we want to substitute? I think I did it by putting these definitions of t into here. Right? So this was m1g minus m1a. Right? That's this tension. And then minus t right means this t right, and that comes over there as positive, but now it's negative again, minus m2g. And this side's positive, but it's minus, minus m2a equals 1 half m3a. That looks ugly, but now the only thing left is a. Right? We just eliminated t. So in the end, I'm not going to do the very ultimate final algebra. Solve that for a, and you get a equals something that looks almost the same, m1 minus m2 over m1 plus m2 plus 1 half of m3 times g. Okay. So just like the simple Atwood machine, here if m1 is bigger than m2, it drives the acceleration that way. It's not making it negative. Let's not worry about that. And uh, the bigger it is, the slower it's going to go. And here, m3, oh yeah, we solved for the magnitude of the acceleration. That's why it's not negative. And here, m3, what is it doing? It doesn't contribute really to the pulling force. It just slows it down. And because it's a, circ a disk, it doesn't slow it down as much. That's why there's the half there. The half is like an artifact from the fact that it's a rotational 1 half mr squared. OK? Would the mass of the pulley usually be given? Uh, it depends on what kind of problem it is. I think in the homework, I gave you this problem, and it's numerical, so yeah. But I think the only thing now you have to do on the homework is go back to find the tensions. But I bet you can do that. Okay. Okay.